welcome to the India Global Forum studio. I'll introduce my guests in just a moment. We've been speaking here about uh, about money, how it's changing, how financial infrastructure is changing, and we're going to move on to a case study now of the importance and the opportunity of fintech investment in building powerful financial relationships. And in this case, between India and the Middle East, the GCC, uh, and the UAE in particular. It's already a thriving corridor, and as I spoke yesterday with His Excellency uh, Minister Alo Lama he said actually that the trading partnership between India and this part of the world goes for 4,000 to 5,000 years. So this is nothing new. And actually Indians send more remittances uh, back home from the UAE than from any other place outside North America. So we want to talk about this, but actually what more is possible. And I'm delighted to have two people directly involved in this challenge here with me. Pleased to have Niraj Makin. He's the Senior Executive Vice President and Group Head, International and Group Strategy, Emirates NBD here in the UAE, uh, as well as Shruti Rajan. Thanks very much for coming. Partner, Corporate Financial Regulatory Trilegal India. It's a good title. Thank you. It's a lot of words. Welcome to you. It's a lot of work. <laughs> Welcome to you both. Let me start by asking each of you, first of all, to describe the business that, that you're doing uh, and the opportunity that you see for growth. Niraj. <coughs> Thanks. Thanks for having us here today. So Emmets and BD, we are one of the largest banks in the Middle East, the second largest in UAE. We are about $200 billion asset size bank. We present in 13 countries. Uh, some of our key markets are... Uh, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, our growing presence in India. We've got three branches in India now. Uh, and then we are also present in London, Singapore. We've got uh, a subsidiary in Austria, which operates in Austria and Germany, and a single branch presence in Moscow. So that's the remit. We follow what we call as our Minatsa strategy, Middle East, North Africa, Turkey, and South Asia. Now, is that's that unusual? Are you unusual for a bank for operating in those separate countries? We are. We are. We're probably one of the only banks which has a presence across this corridor. Hmm. And we call it right from straddling the, from Asia, from Singapore to London. But, but a key uh, focus area is obviously Turkey, Egypt, Saudi, UAE, India. I think this is, this is the thing. We're the probably only bank which is present in all these markets. There is no Indian bank present in Egypt, hmm. Turkey or Saudi. How does that make you feel? Very unique <laughs> and very special. <laughs> Yeah. Interesting. Shruti, tell us about your, your business and as well and how you're straddling this particular corridor as well. Sure, sure. So um, I'm a partner with Trilegal. We're one of India's largest law firms, full service. I think uh, in addition to what we would normally do as a corporate law practitioner, uh, for us, certain specific sectors are of tremendous focus as, as lawyers, uh, financial services and technology being one of them. Um, I think India, nobody needs to say it today, but India is in the thick of things, right? India is online. The world is watching mm. both from a financial services and technology space. I think we've managed to meet that sweet spot where technology is being used to disrupt the market. It's being used to increase financial inclusion. It's changing the product mix that a lot of financial services want to take to customers. And most importantly, I think all of this is user driven. It's customer driven. Mm. And for us as lawyers, where this comes in is we are at the cusp of it all, right? Because we help the product manufacturers really understand the regulatory framework of what they're selling to customers, mm. how they should be selling it. And at the same time, we make an effort to ensure that everything that happens from a policy perspective, you know, what we, uh, you know, kind of reach out to regulators with is something that overall benefits the, the direction in which we want to see the economy going. So yes, no better time to be a lawyer in India, I suppose. <laughs> Give us an example of one of the products that you've had a, a positive impact on by helping the customer explore or understand the regulatory impact. So I wouldn't uh, want to talk about it as a firm specific thing, of course. So let me maybe just give you an example of, of how we've seen certain products develop in the Indian market mm. uh, recently. So as you know, with COVID coming in, it's really changed customer behavior in terms of how they access 
um, you know, the, the digital ways of, of uh, availing of services. Uh, financial sectors obviously benefited from that. For us, I think three key points, and I know, you know, kind of sport is in the air in this part of the world. So maybe <laughs> I'll use an analogy of, you know, maybe making things um, more, uh, uh, you know, wider in terms of their the spectrum and the stronger, right, in terms of how they are regulated. So one big aspect of this is how has financial services become more accessible to people? Uh, that is clearly happening today because of the regulator's effort to allow things to be served you know, online. A big example of that is even small things like wealth management, like mm. stock broking, a lot of the embedded financing options that bank of, of banks and non-banking financial companies offer online to customers today, their ability to do EKYC, their ability to onboard customers through certain specific products, the payment systems and the payment mm. tools that today you have the unified payment interface, which is an exceptional, exceptional Make in India initiative that's, you know, really taken the world by storm. So all of these various enabling factors have come together to really make it happen. I think where we would see our role as lawyers would really to be to strengthen all of these pieces by helping them understand the regulatory framework, helping them comply, helping them mitigate risk. And of course, you know, working with the regulator to try from a policy level to see how things can be done better. Mm, interesting. So, you know, we've spoken a lot this week during the conference about this new phase of globalization in which actually bilateral relationships are perhaps more important at the moment than multilateral ones. And I'd love to hear about the effect of the, the bilateral trade agreement, we can call it SEPA from now on, but the, the agreement between the UAE and India and how you expect that to change or enhance your business. I think it's a very, very important development. And uh, uh, I was listening to uh, the minister and the ambassador earlier this mm -hmm. morning, and they were mentioning that SEPA came into being or from 1st of May. And they're already seeing about a 30% increase in certain trade, uh, you know, segments, which has happened. Now, we obviously, from a banking side, we've also seen a, a whole lot of uh, change in the conversations we are already having with some of our clients. Some of the key stuff which we are doing when, when I call it the India-UAE corridor, uh, we helping a lot of Indian companies trade using UAE as a springboard to go into wider North Africa, Africa region, Central Asia. Mm. Uh, and Dubai being a trade hub, we also have a good trade links with the wider Asia network. So we already talking to you know certain segments like uh, your uh, basic materials, right? Uh, iron ore and all those side of mining companies which are mining in India and exporting that stuff. Mm. They're talking about how they can use UAE as a trade hub, how we as a bank can come in between to kind of fin finance and uh, confirm those trade uh, uh, transactions. Um, on the other side, uh, India is a huge importer of energy and specifically on the oil and gas side, right? So crude oil being imported into India, being refined in India, and then re-exported back to countries like Bangladesh, Malaysia and all and everything. And there are global trading houses which sit either in UAE, which sit in Singapore, and that straddles, you know, very nicely with our network to kind of fund and finance those. Specifically between India and UAE, the another area where we're seeing is bullion and jewelry, mm -hmm. fine jewelry. So bullion, UAE is again a hub. You import gold and the gold is imported into India via UAE where there are traders sitting out here and then... But I imagine that's already happened, right? How does this trade agreement make it easier? So it makes it easier because the tariffs have gone down. So okay. people can do a lot more, mm. right? Uh, uh, you know, their margins improve because of that. It becomes much more easier. Your cycle times in terms of a trade being confirmed payment being done that improves. And on the other side, what we are working on, what Shruti was talking about from a payment technology perspective. So we've done a lot of work on the P2P side for the payments, but there's an immediate need for the commercial payments to kind of also digitize and be made STP. That is something a work STP. in progress, straight through processing. No okay. man will touch, right? Today uh -huh. for a payment, you will send something, somebody in the bank will kind of put it into the system. It'll go via Swift. Mm -hmm to a correspondent so bank and all so and everything. Long. Yep. So many numbers you have to Exactly. Input. And it might take four days, five days for that payment to be realized. Mm. 
what we are looking at and what even clients want that look once a good or a service has been delivered i should be able to receive my payment mm. right or i should be able to receive my payment in advance i don't want to take the risk of that and that's where we as banks step in and can i just ask you though because don't banks make a lot of money on that uh on that time in between me sending my money into the person receiving it on the other end i'm interested that as a bank you'd like to get rid of that that time look i think that is a uh, you you make money but there are multiple institutions which are involved out there right. right so it's not that a single bank is making money and mm -hmm. and and that to me is more of a friction to provide a a better customer service so we don't see that benefit rather than money reaching our client and our mm. client being happy i think that is something which probably all financial institutions would want to do interesting so should you talk to us about regulation too little regulation and we get things like ftx uh, i was really interested to to learn yesterday that actually uh, ftx only had the very first level of of license here in the uae and you can see what happened as a result you know people actually seem to be quite relaxed about about yeah. it here when i've been speaking to but too much and we get tied up into knots and i come from the us i live in the uk enough on the regulation. How would you describe the current regulatory environment uh, between India and the UAE and how what potentially is coming through from SEPA or other arrangements might improve it? Sure. So, you know, you've got me started on my favorite topic. So I, I may get a little <laughs> philosophical about this, but look, the regulatory framework in any part of the world, right, it has to kind of meet that sweet spot or that fine balance between principle-based regulations mm. and and rule-based regulations, right. the way we call it. A rule-based regulation would simply mean that you tell them, okay, you can only do A, B, C, D, you cannot do mm. you know, F, O, I, F, G, H. But in a principle-based regulation, which is common, say, in places like the UK, mm. you would typically tell them, look, these are the role, rules of the road. These are you know, what we expect as conduct from you as a market participant. Now you go figure, mm -hmm. right? Any uh, developed, sophisticated regulatory regime has to draw that fine balance between the two, has to be able to say that which area, which asset class needs the rules mm -hmm. and what kind of product or you know market service actually requires principle based regulation i think today in india and look any cross border collaboration that we do is only as good as the f rules that we have nationally mm. first, right? Because our national framework has to be the starting point and we can only improve upon that as we go ahead and collaborate across the border. And today I think across our central bank, which is the RBI, our securities market regulator, our insurance regulator, we've done a great job of being able to work together but still retain that independence in terms of how we want to uh, you know, manage each of our areas, where that translates into an excellent opportunity for cooperation, some of which we're already seeing, is actually in the IFSCA, which as you know, is a international financial service center that's mm -hmm. been set up in India. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's really a, uh, you know, a local territory, but it's considered to be an offshore financial mm. center with all of the tax incentives that, that goes with it. And that has a unified regulatory format, right? It takes people from each of the local regulators offshores there. And these regulators in turn, especially on the fintech space, have been very active in collaborating with regulators overseas. So, you know, that's why it's kind of like a trickle down effect because the starting point is the national regulators who then converge at the unified regulators hand, which in turn is entering into all of these and using that platform of gift as a controlled environment to develop fintech in collaboration with with uh, all the different regulators. Gift City is a, it's a really interesting um, place to start. And I wonder if you can give me an example of something that you've seen happen there that you could see replicated elsewhere. Sure. So I think the fintech hub, and I would say that, uh, you know, the, the scheme that we have today in the gift city to grow fintech businesses is, is not very different from what, you know, I think you'd have at the DIFAC yep, yep. and in, mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in various versions. But it's still a phenomenal start for a country like India because you have the talent, you know, you have businesses which are looking for capital. You have businesses which tomorrow may actually go ahead and list on the on the stock exchanges and gift. So the fintech platform that gift is providing today is 
absolutely fantastic. It meets the international standards, if not more, of anything else that you would see in Asia, where there are two things they're doing, right? They're using it almost as an incubatory space mm. for different regulators to come together. See, they have the advantage which mainland does not, right? They have one regulator there. Right. So they actually use that to their benefit. They incubate businesses that they think will work, and they also give grants. So they have a mechanism to actually choose businesses and give them grants. So that's, I think, a perfect example of, of how Interesting. it's going to work. This is, exactly, yeah, this is exactly what you know, DIFC has been doing out here. Mm -hmm. So DIFC, again, an offshore regulator, which has taken the best of the world from mm -hmm. you know, uh, linking what happens with uh, in UK, in, in Hong mm -hmm. Kong, in Singapore, and, and they've created this innovation fund. They've also created this hub mm -hmm. where uh, you know, these startups can come in. So I, I think I see a lot of similarities yeah. between the two. But interestingly, it's not only about these offshoring centers or special regulatory environments which you need to create. I think the, the main regulators out here are also collaborating. And a couple of examples which I can give you. So India started off with UPI, the United, mm -hmm. uh, Unified Payment Initiative or Infrastructure, mm -hmm. which has been hugely successful incredibly in India, successful right uh, now UAE central bank has come up with something very similar which they call the nation national payment service mm -hmm. infrastructure or scheme NPSS right uh, they're still working on it but while they're working on it they're already tying up with UPI mm. and what we are envisaging to happen as we go forward is that UPI will be linked with NPSS given that large diaspora of Indian population out here both white collar and blue collar, you know, and there are these people who yep. remit their money and across. Today they have, they go to an exchange house, they, there is a lot of fees they have to pay. Money probably takes three or four days to kind of reach the uh, destination. Uh, we as a bank have done a few things. We have a product called Direct Remit, which has kind of done very well. We do $2 billion of, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. remittances to India. Mm -hmm. But the key thing, which the regulatory aspect is kind of bringing in, that if the UPI and PSS get linked, these guys can probably transfer money to a person's mobile phone. Like we as a bank can only yeah. transfer money to a bank account. So a person needs to have a bank account to receive that money. But the next level of thing is that I can receive money on my mobile phone. And given the mobile telephony revolution in India the, or the telecom revolution in India, there are people in the hinterland who are now moving around with those uh, basic smartphones. Which I mean, are out there. if we just put this into a picture of what it might look like, it's somebody who's working in Dubai. It doesn't matter if they're working uh, in, in your bank or mm -hmm. they're working as a cleaner. Yep. Uh, and they could immediately, via two different payment systems, if, mm -hmm. if, this, if this collaboration works, send money immediately to their grandmother's phone in a village somewhere. Yes. I mean, I have deep envy, I've got to say. Uh, so, this is impossible from, yeah. <laughs> from so the UK we, to the US. We as a bank in a current infrastructure can yeah. do that in 60 seconds if the person on the other side has a bank account. And I can right. do it in any bank account, right? Mm -hmm. But the next step for us is to kind of, you know, we as banks using the NPSS and UPI to tie it up with the mobile. So then you have the money in your yeah. UPI wallet or something or whatever. And, and that to me is going to be a game changer. How fast do you think that could happen? I think given the way the technology and infrastructure is moving, you can talk about anywhere in 60 seconds to... But in terms of wh when we'll be able to see this happen? Oh, when, uh, look, NPSS is something which is being set up and evolving. I do see NPSS to come into full being or full flow in the next 6 to 12 months. Mm here in the UAE. UPI is all pretty much well set up. And then it's all about joining the connections and joining, getting those APIs done. So you could see something like that happening anytime in yeah. 12 to 18 months. Interesting. Didi, with your permission, I'm actually going to, uh, you know, supplement what he just said. And, uh, you know, this is just, I think, to give the world a sense of the reach of UPI today as a mm. product. Because uh, one of the, uh, you know, the regulatory motors of all our regulators has always been to ensure financial inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just the top 1-2% yep. that you want financial services and products to reach to. You need it to percolate through all the various demographics that inhabit, you know, a country as diverse as India. And UPI, I think, has been exhibit A of mm -hmm. that endeavor. It is... Today in India, it's, it is both fascinating and humbling, I would say, mm. to just look at the kind of people who are using UPI. You know, I would, uh, there are people who would say be driving public transport, what we call an mm. auto rickshaw or mm. somebody who's selling street food. If you go to them and you don't have change and you may be incurring an expense of less than a dollar 
with them. Mm. They'll say, I have my QR code, just pay me through UPI. Right. Yeah. And that moment, you know, is when mm. the penny drops as to what an enormous accomplishment mm. it is. Because more often than not, it's really not the changes that happen at the macro level. Yeah. It is, of course, you know. But it's also how it changes lives of individuals mm. because collectively that's what, you know, brings the economy up upwards and it's, it's, it's amazing. There's another angle to it, right? With that money going into a bank account through Correct. UPI or through a wallet, yep. your uh, saving ability for that person on mm -hmm. the street who's a seller or who's that rickshaw driver mm -hmm. or something also goes up because cash can get lost, cash mm -hmm. can get this thing. But with that money lying Absolutely. in the account, your saving potential and that automatically, you know, increases the potential for that person to ride mm -hmm. up the economic curve. So are there any downsides to this cashless society, do you think? I think fraud mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, there are lots of people around the world who are waiting for these kind of things, who want to uh, use your digital footprint or something to defraud you of mm. your hard-earned money or something. Uh, physical, it's a different kind of fraud which happens out there or a different way to rob you. But yes, one important aspect is I think regulation is very important from that perspective mm -hmm. so that you have the right KYC and all. Mm. Uh, and obviously, you know, uh, money being used to kind of perpetuate crime or something mm. or whatever. So from that perspective, uh, Organizations, whether be it regulators, whether be it financial services player, or whether be it mm -hmm. end service providers, they have to be very mindful and very uh, clear about how they're going to protect from from those mm -hmm. yeah. systems. Have to be robust. Uh, you know, compliance has to be robust, mm -hmm. um, and uh, your cybersecurity has to be very good, so that yeah. the digital identity and that money which moves around through those digital rails or this thing is not lost, or somebody doesn't use it for other nefarious activities. Well, that's the issue, right? Because, and it may not even be nefarious, but we have this digital exhaust that, that follows us wherever we go. It's like a mm. sort of trail that we leave. Um, you know, every time I open my phone, every time I use Google Docs, which I'm using here. And I do wonder who has access. And I imagine that this is something that as a, you know, who thinks about laws and protection, it's not just privacy, it's who gets to see Correct. what I'm about, right? That is true. And I think that, you know, all jurisdictions are going through that churn, yes. right? Because mm. at some level, it is a trade-off. Because in order to avail of services on a digital platform, there is a minimum amount of information that needs to be put into a system. How we protect that system? Who has access to that system? Can you monetize that system? Those are all, I think, issues that globally we are, we are grappling mm. with. But to go back to some of the points that, you know, you, you raised in your question, of course, today, I think as, as economies, as, as, you know, legal practitioners, as regulators, we're all cognizant of two big risks. One is in India, especially, and the kind of people today who could potentially be accessing digital payments, there is a burning question of financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Because what is happening is a lot of, you know, these, uh, these apps, they tend to gamify yeah. The, the exchange of money at yeah. some level. I remember this friend of mine said, you know, I, I shopped something and when I paid on UPI, I didn't feel like I was spending. And I thought that's true because, right. you know, it's just a click of a couple of buttons right. and you don't feel like you've swiped a card. You haven't no. taken an active action of putting pulling cash out of your wallet yeah. or swiping a card, yeah. right? And I think it's there is... worse when it gets it to the watch. You just tap the watch as you go by exactly. and that's you know, it. What, you, what, what you're talking about reminds me of the time when the credit card was getting prevalent in India in the late 90s and my father used to talk about it he said this is the worst thing because you don't know what you're spending <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly so i think that's the risk right that right. you have almost like a cognitive dissonance mm. about spending because it doesn't yeah. feel like you know how you've been spending money all these years and i think that's where regulators are coming in with a lot of uh, you know nudges as well as rules around mm. how you market these products there have recently been a few online lending products and you know few kind of payment uh, you know uh, related products which regulators have not been very happy with those are the kind of businesses that they've been trying to pull the shutters on mm. so they've they're very vigilant about this part as well interesting Talk about data that's a very final important. word so, yeah. yeah so data privacy is something which again the regulator especially in the financial services are taking very seriously we as banks have been subject to a lot of scrutiny as to who has access to that data mm. who owns data 
And there are governments and uh, uh, regulators which are also now forcing uh, uh, banks or financial services institutions to keep the data, which we call PII, personally identifiable information. Mm -hmm. That has to be very closely protected and possibly kept within the borders. Yep. So we as a bank, which banks on in, in multiple jurisdictions and all, uh, for us, the cost uh, to provide that digital infrastructure has suddenly gone up because I have to keep my data for that particular country in mm. the local Within jurisdiction. The India is doing Localized, that, yeah. Saudi is doing that, uh, Egypt is asking for the same. Fascinating. Well, we could go on and on and on, but sadly our time has run out. But I'd like to give an enormous thank you to both Niraj and to Shruti for joining me. Okay. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the India Global Forum studio again very soon. Thank you, and we'll be Thank back you. right after this. Thank you.